Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, Chloe, and Bella. And as always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And today we're going to get into the summary and analysis of book four of Homer's Odyssey. And then we're going to read book five. And without further ado, let's get there. All right, we're back to the summary and analysis of Book Four in Homer's Odyssey. And, okay, the summary. The King and Queen of Sparta. When they arrive at Sparta, Telemachus and Pisistratus are warmly welcomed. Telemachus is moved to tears by Menelaus' recollection of his friend Odysseus. The King and Queen recalls some of Odysseus' exploits at Troy but postpone serious talk until the next day. In the morning, Menelaus expresses outrage at the behavior of Penelope's suitors and encourages Telemachus by telling him that Odysseus is alive and captive of Calypso. Back in Ithaca, the suitors have discovered that Telemachus is gone and plan to ambush his ship on its return. Penelope is distraught to learn of her son's trip and the planned assassination, but is soothed by a vision sent by Athena. Homer leaves the plot of Telemachus dangling a selected suitor's body vessel to sell, set up the surprise attack. Analysis Menelaus's queen is the same Helen whose abduction from Sparta caused the, the uh, Trojan, well, you know, the face that launched a thousand ships. I'm curious as to see what she looked like. They really don't have any real way of knowing. Anyway. Foreshadowing Odysseus' disguise when he returns to Ithaca, Helen recalls how he scarred his body and donned slaves' clothing and ordered the slip into Troy under the guise of a beggar. Still, with the Trojans at that time, she alone suspected that the beggar excuse me, she alone suspected that the beggar was a spy, but she suspect, protected his secret until he was safely gone. Menelaus recalls the crafty Odysseus legendary roots of the Trojan horse that led to the defeat of Troy. Although thrilled to hear these stories, Telemachus is more encouraged by Menelaus's revelation the next day that Odysseus may yet live. In order to learn his, his own way home to Sparta, Menelaus marooned in Egypt had to tra trap Proteus. Poseidon's servant and shape and a shapeshifter who can instantly turn himself into a serpent. <laughs> sure. Pat panther, boar, tree, or even a torrent of water. Protus's daughter, a sea nymph, told Menelaus how to catch her father and get the truth from him. In addition to learning his own way home, Menelaus also learned that Odysseus was alive and a captive of Calypso and Og on Ogigia. Or Gagia, or whatever. Over the centuries, some scholars have asserted that no one poet could have presented the world of the Iliad and that of the Odyssey in the Iliad. Many of the same characters as those found in the Odyssey are filled with the vigor of youth and devoted to the honors of war or the thrills of lust. Helen is an example. She was, as Christopher Marlowe would write, more than 2,000 years after the creation of Odysseus excuse me, creation of the Odyssey, the face that launched a thousand ships, like I just said, and burnt the topless towers of Ilium, the woman whose abduction was the catalyst for the Trojan War. Although she is still quite striking, in the Odyssey she is matronly, middle-aged hostess, far different from the Helen who drove men to such desire that they were willing to go to war for her. However, the disparity between her portrayal in the Iliad and that in the Odyssey need not be interpreted as evidenced against a single author. Instead, it merely marks the passage of time, approximately 20 years. Helen, like all the principals from the Trojan War who are still alive, is simply older. It's like we all get. Everyone gets a little older. There we go. 
the amazing thing about Odysseus is that despite the passage of years, he'll be able to rise to the insult of the suitors and once more take arms as he did in his prime. That's the end of the summary and analysis. And let's actually, let's get on to the book itself, book five. Okay. Book five. Alrighty. Sweet Nymph in Open Sea. Dawn came up from the couch of her reclining, leaving her Lord Tithonos brilliant side with fresh light in her arms for gods and men, and the master of heaven and high thunder, Zeus, went to his place among the gods assembled, hearing Athena tell Odysseus, Woe! For she, being vexed that he was still sojourning to the, in the sea chambers of Calypso, said, O father Zeus, and gods and bliss forever, let no man holding scepter as a king think to be mild or kind or virtuous. Let him be cruel and practice evil ways, for those Odysseus ruled cannot remember the fatherhood and mercy of his reign. Meanwhile, he lives and grieves upon that island, enthralled him to the nymph. He cannot stir, cannot fare homeward, for no ship has left him, fitted with oars, no crewmen or companions to pull him on the broad back of the sea. And now murderers hatched on the high sea against the son who sought news of his father in the holy lands of Pylos and Lake Adamon. To this the summoner of cloud replied, My child, what odd complaints you let escape you? Have you not you yourself arranged this matter, as we all know, so that Odysseus will bring these men to book on his return? And are you not the one to give Telemachus a safe Route for sailing, let his enemies encounter no one and row home again. He turned then to his favorite son and said, Hermes, you have much practice on our missions. Go make it known to the soft braided nymph that we whose will is not subject to error order Odysseus home, let him depart, but let him have no company. God or gods or men, only a raft that he must lash together, and after twenty days worn out at sea, he shall make land upon the Garden Isle, Sakira of our kinsmen, the Phaeacians. Let these men take him to their hearts in honor, and berth him in a ship, and send him home with gifts of garments, gold and bronze. So much he had not counted on from Troy. Could he have carried home his share of plunder? His destiny is to see his friends again, under his own roof, in his father's country. No words were lost on Hermes, the wayfinder, who bent to his to tie his beautiful sandals on, ambrosial gar golden, the, that carry him over water or over endless land in the swish of the wind, and took the wind with which he charms himself, or excuse me, with which he char charms asleep, or when he wills awake the eyes of men. So wand in hand he paced into the air, shot from Pyaria down, down to sea level, and veered to skim the well, a gull patrolling between the wave crests of the desolate sea, will dip to catch a fish and douse his wings. No higher, excuse me, no higher above the white caps Hermes flew until the distant island lay ahead. Dry throat. There you go. Then rising shoreward from the violent ocean, he stepped up to the cave. The vine Calypso, the mistress of the isle, was now at home. Upon her hearthstone a great fire blazing, set to the farthest shores with cedar smoke and smoke of thyme. Was it thyme? I'll look it up because I don't like being wrong. And singing high and low in her sweet voice before her loom a weaving, she passed her golden shuttle to and fro. A deep wood grew outside with summer leaves of alder and black poplar, pungent Cypress, ornate birds here rested their stretched wings. Horned owls, falcons, cormorants, long tongued beach combing birds, and followers of the sea. Around the smooth wall cave, a crooked vine held purple clusters under ply of green, and four springs bubbling up near one another, shallow and clear, took channels here and there through beds of violet and tender parsley. Even a god who found this place would gaze and feel his heart beat with delight. 
So Hermes did, but when he gazed his fill, he entered the wide cave. Now face to face, the magical Calypso recognized him, as all immortal gods know one another on sight, though seeming strangers far from home, but he saw nothing of the great Odysseus who sat apart as a thousand times before, and racked his own heart groaning with eyes wet, scanning the bare horizon of the sea. Calypso, loved, lovely nymph, seated her guest in a bright chair of all, sh all shimmering and asked, Oh, Hermes, ever with your golden wand, what brings you to my island? Your awesome visits in the past were few. Now tell me what request you have in mind, for I desire to do it if I can. And if, excuse me, and if it is proper thing to do, but wait, and let me serve my friend. She drew a table of ambrosia near him, and stirred a cup of ruby-colored nectar, f food and drink for the luminous wayfinder who took both at his leisure and replied, Goddess to God, you greet me, questioning me. Well, here is truth for you and courtesy. Zeus may be come, and not my inclination. Who cares to cross that tract of desolation, the bitter sea, all mortal towns behind, but gods that beef and honors for mankind? But it is not to be thought of, and no use for any gods to elude the wall, excuse me, the will of Zeus. He notes your friend, most ill starred by renown. Of all the peers who fought for Priam's town, nine years of war they had before great Troy was down. Homing, they wronged the goddess with great eye, gray eyes who made a black wind blow in the sea's rise, in which his troops were lost in all his gear, while easterlies and current washed him here. Now the command is, send him back in haste. His life may not in exile go to waste. His destiny, his homecoming, is at hand. When he shall see his dearest and walk on his own hand, land, that goddess must, most divinely made shuddered before him, and her warm voice rose, O oh, you vile gods in jealousy, super, supernal. You hate it when we choose to lie with men, if mortal flesh by some dear mortal side. So radiant dawn once took be to bed Orion, until you... Eastful gods grew per peevish at it, and holy Artemis, Artemis thrown in gold, <laughs> hunted him down in Delos with her arrows, and then Dem Demeter of the tassel tresses yielded to Ision mingling and making love. In a furrow, three times plowed, but Zeus found out and, it killed, and killed him with a white-hot thunderbolt. So now you begrudge me too many, to my mortal friend, but it was I who saved him, saw him straddle his own keel board, and the one man left afloat when Zeus rent wide a ship with chain lightning and overturned him in the wine dark sea. Then all his troops were lost, his good companions, but wind and current washed him here to me. I fed him, loved him, saying that he should not die, nor grow old ever in all the days to come. But now there's no eluding Zeus's will. If this thing be ordained by him, I say, so be it. Let the man strike out alone on the vast water. Surely I cannot send him. I have no long oared ships, no company, to pull him on the broad back of the sea. My counsel he shall have, and nothing hidden to help him homeward without harm. To this the wayfinder made answer briefly, to th thus you shall send him then, and show more grace in your obedience to be chastised by Zeus. The strong god, glittering, left her as he spoke. And now her ladyship, having given heed to Zeus's mandate, when the find of Decius in a stone seat this seaward, tear on tear, brimming his eyes, the sweet days of his lifetime, of running out in anguish over his exile, for a long ago the nymph had ceased to please, though he fought shy of her and her desire. He lay with her each night, for she compelled him. But when day came, he sat on the rocky shore and broke his, broke his own heart groaning, which eyes wet scanning the bare horizon of the sea. Now she stood near stood near him in her beauty, saying, O oh, forlorn, man, forlorn man, he still, be still. Here you need grieve no more. You need not feel. Your life consumed here. I have pondered it. <clears throat> And I shall help you go. Come and cut down 
high timber for a raft or flatboat, make her broad beamed and decked over, so you can ride her on this misty sea, stores I shall put aboard for you, bread, water, and ruby-colored wine to stay your hunger, give you a sea cloak and following wind, help you homeward without harm, provided the gods who rule with wide heaven wish it so, stronger than I ought, they are in mind and power. For all he had endured, Odysseus shuddered, but when he spoke his words went to the mark. After these years, a helping hand, O oh God, is what guile is hidden here. A raft, you say, it across the western ocean, rough water and unknown. See where these ships, that glory in God's wind, will never cross it. I take no raft, you grudge me out to sea, or yield me first a great oath, if I do, to work no more enchantment in, to my harm. At this, the beautiful nymph Calypso smiled and answered sweetly, laying her hand upon him. What a dog you are, and not for nothing learned, having the wit to ask this of me, thing of me. My witness, then be earth and sky and dripping sticks that I swear by. The gay gods cannot swear more seriously. I have no further spells to work against you. But what I shall devise and what I tell you will be the same as if your need were mine. Fairness is all I think of. There are hearts made of cold iron, but my heart is kind. Swiftly she turned and led him to her cave, and they went in. The mortal and immortal, he took the chair left home now by Hermes. <clears throat> With the divine Calypso placed before him. Victuals and drinks, drink of men. Then, she, excuse me. With the divine Calypso placed before him. Victuals and drink of men. Then she sat down, facing Odysseus while her serving maids brought nectar and ambrosia to her side, and each one's hands went out on each other's, on each one's feast until they had had their pleasure. And she said, Son of Laertes versus the Laodices, after these years with me, you sh still desire your old home, even so I be wish you well, if you could see it all before you go, all the adversary you face at sea, you would stay here and guard this house, and be immortal, though you wanted her forever, that bride for whom you pine each day, can I be less desirable than she is, less interesting, less beautiful, can mortals compare with goddesses in grace and form? <sighs> to this the strategist Odysseus answered, My lady goddess, here is no cause for anger, my quiet Penelope, how will I know would seem, how well I know would seem a shade before your majesty, death and old age being unknown to you while she must die? Yes, Yet it is true each day. I long for home, long for the sight of home. If any god is marked me out again for shipwreck, my tough heart can undergo it. What hardship have I not long since endured at sea in battle? Let the trial come. Now as he spoke, the sun de set, su dusk drew on, and they retired, this pair to the inner cave, to revel and, most, and rest softly. Side by side, when dawn spread out her finger tips of rose, Odysseus pulled his tunic and his cloak on, while the sea nymph, dressed in a silvery gown of subtle tissue, drew about her waist a golden belt and veiled her head, and then took thought for the great-hearted hero's voyage. A brazen axe head first she had to give him, too bladed and agreeable to the palm, with a smooth-fitting haft of olive wood, next a well-polished adze, and then she led him to the island's tip, where bigger timber grew, besides the alder and poplar, tall pine trees, long dead and seasoned, that would float him high. Showing him in that place her stand of timber, the loveliest of nymphs took her way home. Now the man fell to chopping when he paused, Twenty tall trees were down. He lopped the branches, split the trunks, and trimmed his puncheons true. Meanwhile, Calypso brought him an auger tool, with which he drilled through all his planks, and drove stout pins to bolt them, fitted side by side. A master shipwright, building a cargo vessel, lays down a broad and shallow hull, just so Odysseus shaped the bottom of his craft. He made his decking fast so to close set ribs before he closed the side with longer planking, then cut a mast pole on a proper yard and shaped a steering or to hold her steady. 
She drove long strands of willow in all the seams to keep out, out waves and blasted with logs. As for sail, the lovely nymph Clipso brought him a cloth so he could make that too. Then he ran up his rigging, halyards, braces, and hauled the board, boat on ro rollers to the water. This was the fourth day when he had all ready. On the fifth day she sent him out to sea, but first she bathed him, gave him a scented cloak, and put on a board a skin of dusky wine with water and a bigger skin and stores boiled meats and other victuals in a bag. Then she conjured a warm land breeze to blowing, just blowing joy for Odysseus when he shook out sail. Now the great seaman, leaning on his oar, steered all the night on sleeping, and his eyes picked out the Ple Pleiades, the laggard plowman, and the great bear that some have called the Wayne, pivoting in the sky before Orion of all the night's pure figures. She alone would never bathe or dip in the ocean stream. These stars, the beautiful Calypso, bade him hold on his left hand as he crossed the main, main seventeen nights and days in the open water. He sailed before a dark shoreline appeared. Sicaria then came slowly into view, like a rough shield of bull's hide on the sea. But now the god of earthquakes storming home over the mountains of Asia from the sunburnt land sighted him far away. The god grew sullen and tossed his great head, muttering to himself, Here's a pretty cruise. While I was gone, the gods have changed their minds about Odysseus. Look at him now, just offshore that I of that island. That frees him from the bondage of his exile. Still, I can give him a rough ride in, in and will, brewing high thunderheads. He churned the deep with both hands on his trident, called up wind from every quarter, and sent a wail of rain to blood out land and sea in a torrential night. Hurricane winds now struck from the south and east, shifting northwest in a great spume of seas, in which Odysseus' knees grew slack, his heart sickened, and he said within himself, Ragged man that I am, is this the end of me? I fear the god has told it all too well, predicting great adversity at sea and far from home. Now all things bear her out, the whole rondure of heaven hooded so by Zeus, and woeful cloud and the sea raging under such winds. I am going down that shore. How lucky those Danians were who perished on Troy's wide seaboard, serving the Atridia. Would God, I, too, had died there, and at my end, that time the Trojans made so many casts at me when I stood by Achilles after death. I should have had a soldier's burial and praise from the Achaeans, not this choking waiting for me at sea, unmarked and lonely. A great wave drove at him with toppling crest, spinning him round in one tremendous blow when he went plunging overboard, the oar half wrenched from his grip. A gust that came on howling at the same instant broke his mast in two, hurling his yard and sail far out to le leeward. Now the big wave a long time kept him under, helpless to surface and held by tons of water, tangled too by the sea cloak of Calypso, long, long until he came up spouting brine with streamlets gushing from his head and beard, but still bethought him, half drowned as he was, to flounder from the boat and get a handhold into the bills to crouch there, foiling death across the foaming water, just to and fro. The boat careened like, careered like a ball of tumbleweed blown on the autumn plains, but intact still. So the winds drove this wreck over the deep, east wind and north wind, then south wind and west, coursing each in turn to the <clears throat> brutal hairy. But Eno saw him, Eno, Cadmos's daughter, slim-legged, lovely, once an earthling girl, now in the seas in Nereid, Leucothea, touched by Odysseus, painful buffeting. She broke the surface like a diving bird to rest upon the tossing raft and say, O oh, forlorn man, I wonder why the earth shaker, Lord Poseidon, holds this fearful grudge. Father of all your woes, he will not drown you, though despite his rage. You seem clear-headed still. Do what I tell you. Shred, shed that cloak. Let the gale take your craft and swim for it. Swim hard to get ashore upon Sicario or yonder where it is fated that you find a shelter. Here, make your my veil your sash. It is not mortal. You cannot now be drowned in or suffer harm. Only the instant you lay hold of earth. Discard it, cast it far, far out from shore. 
in the wine-dark sea and turn away after she had bestowed her veil. The nary do dove like a dove like a gull to the windward where dark wayside closed over her whiteness, but in perplexity Odysseus said to himself his great heart laboring, Oh, damned confusion, can this be a ruse to trick me from the boat for some god's pleasure? No, I'll not swim with my own eyes. I saw how far the land lies that she called my shelter. Better to do the wise thing, as I see it, while this poor planking holds. I stay aboard. I may ride out the pounding of the storm, or she cracks up, take to the water then. Cannot think it through a better way. But even while he pondered and decided the god of earthquake heaved a wave against him, laugh as high as a rooftop and of uh, awful gloom and gust of wind hitting a pile of chafe will scatter all the parched stuff far and wide just so when this gigantic billow struck the boat's big timbers flew apart Odysseus clung to its single beam like a jockey's riding meanwhile stripping Calypso's cloak away, away. then he slung around his chest the veil of Eno and plunged head first into the plunged head first into the sea his hands went out to stroke and he gave a swimmer's kick. But the strong earth shaker had him under his eyes and nodded. Go on, go on, wander the high seas this way. Take your blows before you join that race the gods have nurtured. Nor will you grumble even, bef even then, I think, for want of trouble. Whipping his glossy team, he rode off to his glorious home at Agai, or Agay, but Zeus's daughter, Athena, countered him. She checked the course of all the winds, but one commanding them, Be quiet and go to sleep, then sent a long swell running under a norther to bear the prince of Desis back from danger to join the Phaeacians, people of the sea. Two nights, two days in the solid deep sea swell. He drifted <clears throat> many times awaiting death until with shining ringlets in the sit east the dawn confirmed a third day breaking clear over high and windless sea and mounting a rolling wave he caught a glimpse of land what a dear welcome thing life seems to children whose father in the extremity recovers after some weakening and malignant illness his pangs are gone the gods have delivered him so dear and welcome to Odysseus. <clears throat> The sight of land of woodland on that morning, it made him swim again to get a foothold on solid ground. But when he came in earshot, he heard the trampling roar of sea on rock, where cumbers rising shoreward shuddered down, thudded down on the sucking ebb, all sheet, sheeted with salt form, foam. Excuse me. Here were no co coves or harbor harborage or shelter, only steep headlands. Rock fallen reefs and crags. Odysseus' knees grew slack, his heart faint. A heaviness came over him, and he said, A cruel turn this. Never had I thought to see this land, but Zeus had let me see it, and let me too traverse the western ocean, only to find no exit from these breakers. Here are sharp rocks offshore, and the sea a smother rushing around them, rock face. Rising sheer from deep water, nowhere could I stand up on my two feet and fight free of the welter. No matter how I try it, the surf may throw me against the cliffside. No good fighting there. If I swim down the coast outside the breakers, I may find shelving shore and quiet water. But what if another gale comes on to blow? Then I go cursing out to sea once more. But then again, some shark of empathy. Ampithotes, I think. Ampithotes, I think, yeah. May hunt me, sent by the ge genius of the deep. I know how he who makes earth tremble hates me. During this meditation, a heavy surge was taking him, in fact, straight on the rocks. He had been flayed there, and his bones broken. Had not gray eyed Athena instructed him, he gripped a rock ledge with both hands and passing and held on, groaning as the surge went by to keep clear of its breaking. Then the back la backwash hit him, ripping him under the <clears throat> far out. An octopus, when you drag one from the chamber, comes up with suckers full of tiny stones. Odysseus left the skin of his great hands turn on that rock ledge as the boat 
wave submerged him, and now, at last, Odysseus would have perished, battered inhumanly, but he had the gift of self-possession from gray-eyed Athena. So when the <clears throat> backwash spewed him up again, he swam out and alone and scanned his coast with some land spit that made a <clears throat> breakwater. Lo and behold, <clears throat> the mouth of a calm river at length came into view, with level shores unbroken free from rock, shielded from wind by far the best place he had found. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as he felt the current flowing seaward, he prayed in his heart, Oh, hear me, Lord of the stream, how sorely I depend upon your mercy. Derelict as I am by the sea's anger, is he not sacred even to the gods? The wandering man who comes as I have come, in weariness before your knees, your waters. Here is your servant, Lord, have mercy on me. Now even as he prayed, tide at ebb had turned, and the river god made quiet water, drawing him to safety. In the shallows, his knees buckled, his arms gave way beneath him, all vital force now conquered by the sea. Swollen from head to foot he was, and sea water gushed from his mouth and nostrils. There he lay, scarce drawing breath, stirring, deathly spent. In time, as air came back into his lungs and warmth around his heart, he loosed the veil, letting it drift away on the estuary downstream to where a white wave took it under and Eno's hands received it. Then the man crawled to the river bank among the reeds where, face down, he could kiss the soil of earth. And his exhaustion, murmuring to himself, what more can this hulk offer? Su excuse me, what more can this hulk suffer? What comes now in vigil through the night here by the river? How can I, cannot, how can I not succumb being weak and sick? To the night's damp and hoar frost of the morning, the air comes cold from rivers before dawn. But if I climb the slope and fall asleep in the dark forest's undergrowth, supposing cold and fatigue will go and sweet sleep, and sweet sleep come, I fear I make the wild beasts easy prey. But this seemed best to him as he thought it over. He made his way to a grove above the water, an open ground, and crept under when bushes grown from the same spot, the olive and wild olive, a thicket proof against the stinging wind or sun's blaze, fine soever the needling sunlight, nor could a downpour wet it through, so dense these plants were interwoven. Here Odysseus tunneled and rigged together with his hands a wide bed, for a fall of leaves was there, enough to save two men and maybe three on a winter night, a night of winter cold, Odysseus' heart laughed when he saw his leaf bed, and down he lay, heaping more leaves above him, a man in distant field, no hearth fires near, will hide a fresh brand in his bed of embers to keep a spark alive for the next day, so in the leaves Odysseus hid himself, while over him Athena showered sleep that his distress should end, and soon, soon, in quiet sleep, she sealed his cherished eyes. The end of book four, book five that is, and in the next video we will get on to the summary and analysis of book five, and we will start on book six, and we will finish it. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. Please stay safe and healthy, and you have a great night.